Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Where do we find you today? I'm sitting in Moline, Illinois. We're about three hours just, west from Chicago. I was just joking with you uh, before the show started. You got a, a great new book out called Tractor Wars, and you have a book poster. And I said, son of a bitch, you got a better pub, pub, publisher than I do because you got a book poster. I need to I need to hit ours up for some. Um, I guess actually, te technically, we self-published a few of our books. So I'm looking in the mirror at that point. But uh, when did the book come out? Yeah, the book came out uh, January 11th. And that's one of those things that feels like it just happened. It also feels like it happened 15 years ago. But I also was, was got it, five years that I've been working on it. So it's been a long time coming. So was the pandemic the final push? Be like, look, man, you can't do anything else. You may as well finish finish up this book you've been cranking on. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I kept it a secret. And I was about three and a half years in and, and uh, said something to my wife. And she goes, is that what you've been doing? <laughs> I said, yeah, but I don't want to tell anyone. Because once you say it out loud, then you got to do it. And uh, I started working from home in, in March of 2020, like a lot of, of other people. And a couple months later, I said, well, I'm already working all day, every day. I might as well throw this into the mix. And, and I did that. The, the last book I published in 2005, it took five years to find a publisher. And I thought, OK, well, that gives me five years. And a month later, I had a publisher and, and thought, what have I done? Um, so uh, you are of the 400 episodes we've done, to my knowledge, the only archivist we've ever had on the podcast. Uh, tell, tell our listeners what that actually even means, because I, I have a preconceived notion that my wife uh, really just abused me of this morning. So tell me, tell me what an archivist does. Well, I, I don't work in a basement, so that may be the first stereotype I can, I can debunk. Um, but basically, we're in the business of acquiring, preserving, and making records accessible. And, and a record is a generic term for everything from handwritten correspondence, in my case, from John Deere, a letter written by John Deere, a, a photograph, a, a glass plate negative, a film from the 1920s. Um, today, it means born digital records. It means archiving the Internet. Um, but it's, it, it's deciding what we're keeping and who to make it accessible. So if you think about history and what we see and what we write, um, archivists are on the front lines of, of what we know and, and what we have because you can't keep everything. Yeah. I told my wife, I said, it's, it's, um, the complimentary concept in my mind comes like a collector. Uh, like, but like if he, he's like, whatever you do, don't say hoarder. Cause I give my wife a, a hard time for being a hoarder all the time. And there's nothing that really, um, tweaks, tweaks the, the conversation more than that. But, um, this so is, there's this a fine line. line. This There's is top a fine of mind for me because I'm a collector and hoarder and archivist. Uh, it's, to, it's, it's, it's top of mind for me because we're renovating our house. And I wish I had gone back and said, you know what? I'm going to go cold turkey. I'm going to get rid of all my possessions and start anew. But I didn't. And then once you're in the middle, you kind of like it's this infinite rabbit hole of what do I keep? What do I get rid of? And it was actually like the, the mental time spent on that was actually uh, con much more considerable that had you either. Like, it's like, if you're going to clean our garage, you know, you throw one thing away, two things away. Oh, I'm going to keep this. I've had a prep. Anyway, that's not the topic of this podcast, but it may have some threads. Okay. So what was the inspiration for the book? Cause this book is fun because it's not just like coming into it. I was like, okay, this is going to be a, a John Deere history given your position, but you know, it's, it's very much um, a history of not just, um, machine development of the last 200 years and the personalities but the economic history of the u.s and the world of course it's incredibly timely today which we'll get into later given what's going on in the world but what was the original inspiration um what why did you decide to uh put pen to paper for book number two really it was a, a long time coming for me uh, and, and, and I guess there's a couple pieces to it. One is 2018 was the hundredth anniversary of the John Deere tractor. So what comes with that is events and programs and putting together talking points and, and surfacing photos and information and films. So you can, you can have a big event, right. And celebrate your history. Um, the other part of that was questions I've been asked over the years that I've been unable to answer, or maybe didn't prioritize answering. And, and people would say things to me like, Boy, 1918, John Deere got into the tractor business. Why so late? 
And I thought, boy, 1918, that does not seem late to me. Um, but I don't understand the, the context, the landscape to know if that was late. Was it early? What did that mean? Um, I, I came up with this, this really an answer that was for me more than anything, um, which was, well, John Deere was, was later than those before them and before those after him. And, and that's my way of going, I have no idea. And I'm really bothered that you keep asking me the question, but it's all relative, right? <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, it's fun for me personally, because, uh, you know, so many people in this country are, are immigrants at some point, whether that's recent or, or not so recent. And a lot of my crew on my father's side uh, came from France and Germany. Um, but in the time period really profiled in the book, you know, the, the 19th century, um, mostly into kind of Nebraska and Kansas part of the world. Um, and that whole side of the family, I grew up with with farm background and still farmers there today. Um, and I, I have a lot of fond memories of, of being on the farm in the, in the early days. But um, let's start in the beginning, you know, the presumably, and I don't want to give away all the secrets of the book, because I want people to go read it. But um, it started out not with John Deere, but a different personality and a different company that still exists today. So maybe walk us through kind of this transition from I mean, it's crazy to think about this wasn't that long ago, but from horses to actual machinery. Yeah. And in my perspective, I didn't grow up on the farm. And so I, I grew up in the Quad Cities. Moline's one of the Quad Cities. My dad, dad worked for International Harvester. He was he was in the shop building combines. My grandfather did the same thing. I've got relatives that work for John Deere. Uh, my grandparents met at Minneapolis Moline, a company that kind of comes out of this later in the in the 30s. Um, and so my perspective was very much from the corporate archives of, well, I see records. I have an interest in personalities. I have an interest in people. Why did they make decisions? So it's very much a, a different perspective versus looking specifically at the machines. Um, but there's this transition going on, especially in the United States in the early 20th century. Some of that's led by the internal combustion engine. Um, which we start to see on the farm in these small stationary engines or one and a half, three horsepower engines that all of a sudden now you've got mechanical power to run an irrigation pump um, or a threshing machine. Some of that, um, you know, larger form of that are these big steam engines. But you get into the 19 teens, World War One, you see other other kind of world events. Now, all of a sudden you've got um personnel shortages you've got a need to produce more with less and that's really what it's all about it's the same story we have today and you have a company like international harvester that's 10 times the size of john deere they're the fourth or fifth largest company in the united states today it's hard for us to believe you think about a farm equipment manufacturer they're they're one of the top manufacturers and half of their sales are outside of north america they're very much leading the charge from steam to gasoline tractors but you start to see this overlap between early automobile manufacturers and early tractor manufacturers and that was something that really drew me into the story and um so what was the initial development and rollout of tractors place place it for us on the timeline um and was it a scenario where it was just one person, one company that develops it and, and becomes the monopoly? Or was there like, you know, a hundred of these companies, um, you know, that kind of all rolled out at the same time? And what year, what year kind of time timeline would this be? Yeah, the um, so 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 in my mind, 1912 is kind of a, a, a big year. And there's five or six tractor manufacturers. And, and in fact, it's really hard to tell because no one was keeping the data. No one's keeping the statistics because a tractor manufacturer really isn't a thing. Um, but you had some, you, you had a number of early companies that started in the late 19th century and, and they're building one or two or three machines. They're all different. They're crudely manufactured. So the idea of a tractor manufacturer doesn't really exist. Um, the industry total is a couple thousand machines. And so that goes from 1908, 1910. You have a company like John Deere whose board passes a resolution in 1912 that we're gonna investigate the tractor market. We're gonna figure out whether or not there's a future because they didn't know. 
um, and figure out all the different types of tractors. Some of these things are 50, 60 horsepower. They're enormous machines. There's some smaller ones that don't work. They tip over. Um, so that's 1912. There are 6 million farms in the United States. Um, most of them are less than 50 acres. So compare that today, the average farm is 440, 450 acres. Um, there's about 2 million farms in the United States. So a third of what there was 100 years ago. Um, so tractors up to that point are mostly big. They're built for big farms out West. So if you're in Illinois, if you're in Kansas, you're not buying a tractor because you don't have enough land. It doesn't make financial sense. Uh, it doesn't make financial sense for you. Um, but between 1912 and 1918, you see this huge boom. What really changes the game is 1913, a company called the Bull Tractor Company bursts onto the scene. Now its founder, this is his third or fourth go around in the tractor business. He hasn't gotten it right yet. And so he's a, a serial entrepreneur. He's trying to develop the next, next thing. Well, what he develops is a small tractor pulls one or two plows and most tractors are used to actually just pull a plow it's used for tillage work in that period in time but it goes from non-existent to market leader in in, in a period of a year mm -hmm. it's not very effective um it's not <laughs> a good mechanical tractor it breaks down it tips over you know this is big heavy equipment but it's small and most importantly it's affordable so if i own 50 acres i can afford to replace two horses with a tractor. So um, it's got to make financial success to make that investment. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a handful of manufacturers. Um, it goes from a dozen to 100 in a couple of years because they say, oh, we can design and build a small tractor. So that was really the, the impetus for this just huge explosion in manufacturers and different styles of tractors um, in the 19 teens. Yeah. And so, you know, it's funny, I was watching some um, sort of history channel uh, overview of the tractor space. And it's, it's fun to put images to kind of what's going on, because you had, you forget, you know, um, some of these designs, uh, some were, like you mentioned, like the Caterpillar, just like these giant machines, and some uh, were steam powered, and some had the, the steel wheels and the pneumatic tires, like on and on these like little innovations. But at the origins, in many cases, Ford and others, it was kind of almost, um, uh, you know, people designing these things in their kitchen because these were in many, in many cases, in the early days. Sorry, going back, you know, earlier uh, to to what you think of when you think of invention and, and innovation. Um, you touched on something that I think is is uh, important as you think about technology adoption at the time. You know, farming. And that period was very much a family almost, you know, endeavor 500 acres, uh, you know, is, is um, still a lot, but, but for many, uh, you know, way smaller than the giant uh, farms of today. But farming has also been a, a, a story of booms and busts. You know, we had um, uh, very much, even recently farming, a lot of crops in the last decade has been pretty subpar style returns, but not as bad as uh, back to the over leverage. What was its uh, 80s, I think, when a lot of farms really struggled. But take us back to the early 20th century, you had a lot of geopolitical stuff going on, world wars, a pandemic, we can say that, you know, a Spanish yep. flu, um, a little more familiar today. But uh, there was a lot of macro trends going on, and one of which was the the war development of tanks and, and and other things like that. Talk to me a little bit about the influences that played out. Was was that a massive push for kind of the track uh, the development of a machinery on farms at the time, or was it totally pull from actual farmers themselves? No, I, I think it was really all the above. Um, you've just got a changing. Um, demographic people people are younger um, there's a lot of new new tech in the world amazing things like electricity indoor plumbing um, radios so there's also a lot of of, of really well-paying jobs in, uh, in in the cities you know you think about automobile manufacturers in Detroit going to New York City you know the allure of, of the big city 
similar to today. So you have young people just leaving because they want to do something on their own. Um, they don't want to stay on the farm. It's too traditional. It's been this way for a hundred years, 200 years. I want to go out and do something new. In addition to that, World War I starts in 1914. The United States enters in, in 1917. Um, so that, that does a, a lot of things. But one is now, now young people are leaving to, to go to war. Um, we're also shipping millions of horses uh, overseas. So now you have a horse shortage uh, in the United States and you've got to replace that power with something. So there's a lot of factors uh, and then, of course, you got your early adopters like you do in any industry of, of farmers who are going, OK, well, I want to increase my productivity. I want to go from from being a self-sustaining farm, meaning I can grow enough to feed my family, maybe a couple of hired hands. Um, and, and that's the way it's always been. To, OK, well, now I can produce enough that uh, I can actually run an additional business. I can buy more land. I can invest more um, technology allowed farmers to do that really for the first time. So it's really a sea change. Um, they, they called it power farming. That, that's what manufacturers started to, to use as a phrase to talk about this change in the farming landscape. So talk to us a little bit how this sort of played out with the, the different um, players jostling for dominance. You have a lot of the you know, what everyone recognize, recognizes is like lemonade style one-on-one business tactics going on. You had um, price wars between the offerings and differentiation between features. You had, um, you know, some companies that have sales and distribution that are more localized and more global. Which, which, which of the companies kind of, um, you know, survived and thrived in this environment? And are there any good kind of stories or concepts you think really define that that period i mean there's a lot of these stories and and i really the the narrative of the book follows three it follows john deere international harvester and and henry ford and and really when i started the research it took me three years to figure out who who those companies were and how those narratives were intertwined um you know in 1910 there's a handful of companies by 1920 there's over 160 companies manufacturing tractors um, so you have this kind of huge bubble uh, and they've all got different ideas. If we look at the three main companies, International Harvester is the mainstay. You know, they're they're kind of the gold standard. They start developing what they called an, an, an auto mower. Uh, they get in the automobile business. Uh, they start developing a couple different styles of tractors, which are reliable and, and they're successful, but they're expensive. We're talking it's going to cost you in 1915. Twelve hundred dollars um, to to buy a tractor. It's three times your annual income. So these aren't inexpensive um, purchases. You have a company like John Deere that went from three million dollars in sales in nineteen ten to thirty three million dollars in sales by nineteen eighteen through mostly acquisitions, mergers, um, consolidation of sales branches and things. What that means is they borrowed a lot of money in order to make it happen. And so they're they're a little hesitant because they don't understand the market and they got to get it right, because if they don't get it right, they're going to go bankrupt and they can't find a banker who's going to give them enough money to build a tractor factory or to even facilitate designing a factory. And then you have Henry Ford. The, the Model T is introduced in October of 1908. And in November, he sends a photo and a short letter to the Farm Implement News, which is a farm publication out of Chicago and says, I'm developing a farm tractor. And most people who would have read that would have said, yeah, so is everybody else and who's Henry Ford. Um, six months later, everybody knew who Henry Ford was. <laughs> He's got to stop taking orders on the Model T. And all of a sudden what he has is scale um, over the next couple of years. And I love the Henry Ford story. This is one of the things that sucked me into this overall is the assembly line is really what accelerated the tractor industry. Henry Ford grew up on a farm. He, he often talked about just how monotonous farm work was. He used the word drudgery all the time. He didn't understand traditions on the farm and how a farmer just did the same thing over and over again. And it just drove him crazy. He saw a steam engine when he was 12 and resolved that he was going to build something. 
to reduce drudgery on the farm, but the assembly line allows him to do that. He designs a tractor and now he can crank them out, but his model's different. His model, like the Model T, is one size fits all. International Harvester has a number of different models, a number of different sizes uh, when we talk about horsepower. So they've got a better understanding of their clientele because they know that every farm is different, every crop is different, every geography is different, methods are different, and it changes from year to year, depending on a lot of different factors. Henry Ford said, no, I'm going to build a lot of them. I'm going to build them cheaply. And when he made that announcement that he was going to bring a, a farm tractor to the United States, people just waited. They said, I love my Model T. I'm going to wait for Henry Ford. Well, it took until 1918 for Henry Ford to bring a tractor to the United States. International Harvester is the market leader. A company like Caterpillar is not really in the mix because, well, first of all, Cat doesn't exist until 1925. The companies that went on to form Caterpillar, they're building these track type tractors. They're shipping them overseas for the war effort. So they their strategy is different. We're selling to the government. These other, other companies are selling domestically. So when the war ends, that shakes things up quite a bit. And then you see all these great folks. Uh, Daniel Hartsaw is one of my favorites. He's the, the founder of the bull tractor company that builds this first small tractor. He's a, a pastor from Minneapolis and he sells his car and buys some farmland out West. And he is, a, he and his son develop and, and, and build a, a farm tractor and nobody wants it. They're able to find one person to buy it. And they say, okay, well, we didn't get it right. We're going to design something different. They do, they don't get it right. They're able to sell it and build something different, which eventually becomes the bull tractor company and they kind of get it right. When that fails, he goes on and does something else. And so you see all these people who kind of come and go, they fail, they raise some more capital. So it's a very dynamic industry, which is not what I was expecting. I was expecting, well, here's a dozen companies, they figured it out and they just kind of slowly grew the market. It's a lot more chaotic. It reminds me very much of the dot coms of the 1990s, where all of a sudden, if you're building a tractor, it's really easy to raise capital. Um, and six months later, you're probably skipping town and hiding from your creditors. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and w w were most of these that did raise capital, was it sort of friends and family or bank at that time? Because it's not not a whole lot in the Silicon Valley venture industry at this point that's funding tractor development, or was it corporations? Like who who was, who was funding most of these? Yeah, it, it was mostly friends and family. Then you see these these other larger organizations um, that were were self financing. In, in the case of, of International Harvester, they're self financing, and, and Harvester is interesting because they grew out of two huge companies, McCormick and Deering, who had cornered the the harvesting business. So eighty percent of the products uh, uh, sold on the farm was grain harvesting because that was where you were making the the the, the greatest productivity gains. And so because they were formed of these two companies, they had two separate dealer networks and they developed two separate lines of tractors. They were called Titans and Moguls that were basically distributed through these different uh, dealer channels. They were self-financing and, and, and they went from a few machines to a couple thousand machines and that was enough to lead the industry. John Deere, who'd gone through that period of acquisitions and mergers, had entered new businesses. Uh, they were going to, to the bank and, and, and saying, hey, this is kind of the plan. What uh, what can you do for me? And they said, well, we're not going to do anything for you um, and, and until we start to see some returns on the previous loans. So they went about it in a very different way. And, and what they wanted to do was figure out the, the one type of machine that was going to satisfy the most number of farmers. So they were very much kind of in the Henry Ford camp more than the International Harvester camp to, to start. So as you can expect, it runs across the board. The, um, so give us, we can, uh, we can kind of jump to the future, but, um, here we are obviously with John or excuse me, Deer and company, uh, John Deere is now over a hundred billion dollar market cap company. Um, it's obviously survived, uh, and done exceptionally well. Um, and it's close to all time highs on the stock. I think, uh, over 400 bucks a share, um, what what in the ensuing decades uh tell us what the story was was it a story of uh traditional creative destruction and simply 
uh, survival, a lot of the companies fall away in the free market competition. Um, who became sort of the uh, the juggernauts of this space um, over the uh, the ensuing decades? It's it's really a, a story of of ebbs and flows and, and ups and downs. What really comes out of and the, and the book ends in the in the late nineteen twenties, and and kind of the comment I've had from the most people so far is. Okay, well, clearly this is the first chapter. What happens next? You know, so good. This, this is a trilogy, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The Tractor War trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I've started already. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, you go from this handful to 160 plus manufacturers. And then by 1930, you're down to 30. So this kind of sparks this period of consolidations where you have early innovators in the tractor industry now all of a sudden there's three or four of them getting together and saying okay we have to develop what they call the full line which is we just can't build tractors we just can't build plows we got to build everything that you need on the farm we've got to be a one-stop shop and and that's what really emerges out of out of this period um you also start to see a major shift in machine forms and that's really where Henry Ford got into trouble as he said, well, here's my here's my tractor. One size fits all. Uh, that's great for the first couple of years. Now, you know, all the all the things you really need. So you want to see an evolution of the machine forms and you see that with a number of manufacturers. But then it gets to a point where you've got to produce so many. You've got to build a um, you've got to build an infrastructure. You need mechanics. You need um, sales branches. You need dealerships. You need ongoing service, all of these things. And so it becomes very capital intensive. One of the things to me that's really fascinating about this period is the way they were buying raw materials. They were buying a year in advance. So basically you were projecting what you needed. This idea of, of kind of real time production that we have today, we don't build it till you buy it, didn't exist. So in this period it was, okay, well, we're gonna build 5,000 tractors. We better sell 5,000 tractors you're in trouble when that doesn't happen. It happened to John Deere in 1921. They went from sales of almost 6,000 tractors to under 100 uh, because the economy stalled uh, post-World War I. Now, all of a sudden, you're sitting on all this inventory, and, and it's one of those seminal moments in company history when the board of directors got together and said, is there a future in this? Is, is this our, our exit? Um, because we've only been doing it three years and we haven't turned a profit yet. And in fact, they wouldn't turn a profit until 1926, I think. So this is a very long-term business. If you're a small manufacturer, you can't afford to, to float that for that long. And, and you start to see just the economies of scale for these large manufacturers. And they're able to kind of take a little more risk than maybe the small manufacturer can. Um, so that, that period, uh, in the late 1920s, early 1930s of industry consolidation really changes the landscape. But by then, at least in the tractor business, John Deere and International Harvester have 80% market share. So everyone else is fighting for that 20%. Again, following the parallel paths of these companies, International Harvester went from market leader to a distant second behind Ford to all of a sudden an industry leader again, John Deere is kind of slow and steady. And that's what intrigued me. It's, it's a strange thing to say when I, I really started writing the book, I didn't know if John Deere had a place in it because I knew they had a, a small market share when this all started. They bought the Waterloo Gasoline Engine Company in 1918 in, in Waterloo, Iowa. They sold 5,000 tractors a year, which is a, a strong showing it's top five. But compared to Henry Ford, who sold 30,000 that year and then sold 100,000 a couple of years later and was telling everyone he was going to build a million a year, it's small potatoes. And I thought, OK, well, maybe John Deere doesn't fit. But then you fast forward a decade and now you got 25 percent market share and then you got 30 percent market share. It was just an, an interesting juxtaposition for me that sometimes slow and steady wins the race. And uh, in, in the case of farm equipment, we know that John Deere surpasses International Harvester in 1963. So this book covers the, the, the first third of that story if you wanted to focus on the John Deere International Harvester story.
It's the prequel. So good. Give us a little uh, preview of, uh, of book number two. Um, but you've talked about deer before. So what, what, what was the story of survival and excellence for deer? Was it simply um, just like a blocking and tackling, building better product? Was it a sales and distribution? I know it's an international story uh, rather than just a domestic one. But like if you could look back as an archivist, um, what do you see as the main inflection points for, for Deer as a company and why it survived to be a hundred billion plus market cap company today? It's, it's a really good question. And at the end of the day, this all comes down to decisions, right? And, and we always focus on the right decisions. I, I tend to focus on the hundred, hundred wrong decisions that allowed you to make the right decision. And, and I think one of the formulas for Deer historically is the ability to change and transform. I spent a lot of time thinking about these, these kind of eras in company history. And, and it used to be that th there'd be a series of strategic decisions that are made and, and you would kind of write on that for the next 30 or 40 years. In, in business today, of course, you make that decision and you're gonna write it for a year. Maybe if you're lucky, it could be because you're constantly evolving and transforming. For deer, you have eras like this period of 1910 to 1918. They went into the harvesting business to compete directly with International Harvester for the first time, went into the tractor business, added these competing lines, you grow your business. You also have kind of the, the, the other side of that, which is you're offering stock for the first time in company history. You're, you're making investments in employees. You're attracting talent. We think these are, are modern concepts. They're not. When, when Deere opened its headquarters, current headquarters in 1964 in Moline, it was designed by Aero Saarinen, it was to attra attract top global talent. They, they wanted to build a show place in, in the Midwest to showcase technology to attract talent. And I think that's something Deere's been very good about over the years. You also make decisions that you don't know how it's going to turn out, and sometimes it takes 20 or 30 years to figure it out whether it's going into the tractor business in 1921 saying, well, we know the trend now in farm tractors is going from a two cylinder tractor to a four cylinder tractor. However, we think we understand our customer better. We're gonna stick with the two cylinder tractor, which John Deere did all the way until 1960. Hmm. Um, a lot of people still associate John Deere with those, those two cylinder tractors, the Johnny Poppers. And there's a lot of loyalty that that grows and develops out of that. So I don't know that I gave a good answer. It's a lot of small decisions along the way. But at the end of the day, thinking through scenarios, figuring out what's next, putting your resources into it, it goes a long way. And, and you know that you can make really big mistakes. And um, fortunately for a company like Deer, Deer's gotten it right over the years, at least big picture. You know, it's 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 always interesting to see the current events and how things play out. Obviously, farmland is a huge, uh, and farming in general is a huge, critical piece of the global human story. Um, you look at what the disruptions happening in uh, Russia and Ukraine currently, and and that becomes very real. Um, you have people in the U.S. You know who who are um, moaning about high prices and and I can sympathize with that but then realize the knock-on effects of um, disruption in even one country of a big producer such as wheat and the effects that has in many other poor countries in particular Africa uh, as well as the Middle East um, and it's a very real uh, very real impact um, but what I was gonna say was that, John Deere is having like um, uh, a social media moment where if you watch uh, some of the footage in the Ukraine, you have all these, uh, you know, cell phone camera capturing uh, the Ukrainian farmers towing away the trucks, I mean, the, the tanks. Have you seen any of these videos where it's just like you see this farmer just pulling away a Russian tank, um, which is uh, which is pretty hilarious. And they're all I don't even know if they're all Deere tractors, but they all get associated with being John Deere having the brand. Have you, uh, have you, have you seen any of those uh, stories? Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen some of those. I've seen some of those videos. There was even one, and you never know in this day and age of uh, fake news, but I saw one picture where there's a photo of, of 
John Deere's grave, wherever that may be. And it had a little John Deere tractor like toy with the Ukrainian flag towing a uh, towing a tank. I don't know if it's real, but it uh, it was uh, it was fun to see. I'll have to take um, a look. I live two miles away. Perfect <laughs> for the archives. There you go. I just right. added. Finally, I added something um, of use. Um, so, you know, we're, we're seemingly at an inflection point uh, in history where you had this giant period of history where it was human and animal powered. Then you start to have this age of machines that you document. Um, but really that continues for essentially a, a century or so uh, plus. And then here we are now in 2022. And I've been kind of talking about this the last handful of times uh, I come back from the farm over the years on the podcast. And I say, you know, I look around and I think people have these vacuums that just cleaned their house five, 10 years ago, uninterrupted and talk about easy. You're on a square grid out in the middle of, you know, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, where you bump into something, whatever, there's nothing out there. Um, but alluding to the fact that we are entering this period where there may no, may not be any human involvement at all, or if so, very limited. Um, and this could just be you talking, uh, but maybe this is book three rather than book, or excuse me, book three in the trilogy. Um, what sort of impact and, and what sort of developments and thoughts do you have on, on sort of the new trend towards automation, towards um, autonomy? And it could be, you know, drones and, and planes spraying crops and everything. I mean, I see dozens, if not hundreds of startups in this space. Um, uh, going on. Anyway, long-winded uh, intro, but uh, any, any general thoughts on this this sort of next era? Yeah, I look at it, I mean, very generically as it just, this is what's next, right? Um, at, at the end of the day, the, the drivers haven't changed in 100 years, which is we need to be more productive. We have fewer people feeding more people. Um, there's what less than 8 billion people in the world today and there's going to be 9 billion by 2050 so how do you feed them with less land um and less people working on the land so you've got to you've got to solve for that on some level i think also you can't get too far ahead of yourself and, and what i mean by that is if, if i go back to tractor introduction Tractors didn't outnumber farms or tractors didn't outnumber horses on American farms until the 1950s. So it's not an instant adoption. I compare wow. that to today. Um, if I was an alien and I sat down in Neil's living room and watched TV, um, I would think that every automobile built is an electric automobile because that's all I see. Well, what less than 1% of, of automobiles uh, on the road are electric. So these things take longer to adopt and develop than I think we think they do. Uh, if we're talking about autonomous tractors, if we're talking about using drone technology, these things are happening. They're, they're being developed, they're being um, revised and improved. But that doesn't mean that everyone goes out tomorrow and buys one because there's a lot of other factors in the mix and it's gonna continue to evolve. I do think a, a big change is it, the, the rate of adoption is quicker. I think it's it's a, a slower kind of turnaround time now. Um, and the next innovation is faster than it used to be. You can't ride that technology for 10 or 15 years uh, because someone's gonna beat you to it. And, and I think a really big change, some of this you see with Henry Ford getting into the tractor business. That's not a surprise because he was a farm kid who was always interested in tractors. But I think the I think the worry of disruption is very different than it is today because you can come out of nowhere and introduce technology on the farm and, and you don't have to have any background in that because you're designing technology versus a machine for the farm. And I do think there's some differences there. So at the end of the day, I think it's all just very exciting. I, I can't claim to understand most of it, but you're feeding more people with fewer people and, um, People are going to adopt that because they want to be more profitable. If this is my operation, if I'm a farmer, um, I have to be more profitable in, in order to keep up because I want to earn more on my land. 
and, and I want to continue to build my operation and pass it down to my family and the next generation. Yeah, the story is personal for me because I passed on a autom automation robotics company that John Deere then bought for a quarter of a billion dollars. So uh, I have I have I'm just a little salty uh, wounds about uh, missing out that one because the funniest part is like there are things that are like totally within my wheelhouse. And I think I'm just too close to it. I, I really mostly invest in things I have no idea where uh, uh, what I'm doing. So the stuff that's close to me, uh, and I think this is Bear Bear Flag, maybe was the name yeah. of it. I can't remember something yeah. like that. Black yeah. Flag, Bear Flag, Bear, Bear, Bear flag. flag. Okay, blah. Um, so it's gonna be fun to see what happens. Um, you know, I I, uh, I think um, this constant human struggle between uh growth this malthusian sort of uh you know us uh, increasing into billions of people and the struggle between prices and um innovation and technology is has been one that's been a very human story and it's going to be um crazy interesting to watch how all this plays out we talk a lot about farmland as an asset class and investing on this podcast and so um i think very much most individuals have under allocated to this part of the world. So uh, I think it, it's fun to see some developments there. Um, let's, uh, I want to start to kind of dig in uh, a little bit. Would love to hear um, about your story as an archivist at, at Deer. You know, um, we, uh, I was thinking the other day is like, as you go through um, its part, like um, in my mind, and you can correct me by the way, um, but but in my mind, it's part like Sherlock Holmes, part detective, part simply curator, uh, you know, and, and as uh, someone who's been through like, you know, my dad passed years ago, going through all his old stuff and finding things that no one else had known or things that um, both good and bad or surprises, you read this all the time where people find letters and they're like, oh my God, this, uh, this, is a revelation, good, bad, in between. Tell us a little bit about the process. You know, was this something that was very front loaded on the work uh, and now it's about maintaining and curation or is it something that's an ever evolving story where you get letters from Austria, from somebody who's got, you know, on a, just tell me a little bit about your job, what you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it, it's changed for me personally over time. I, I went to school to be an archivist because I learned at an early age, I loved history. Uh, once I, I finally volunteered at an archive and, and I was going through letters written during the Civil War, I just thought it was the coolest thing that, you know, here's someone writing a letter and I'm holding it and I can't believe it survived, wanting to know more about the person, their family who read the letter, those sorts of things. So that's really what got me excited. I've, I've learned that I really just very much like going through other people's things, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is always a lot of fun. You know, I, I grew up in an era of Indiana Jones, so I, I, I went through that phase where I wanted to be a world renowned archaeologist and then realized I didn't want to be on my hands and knees in the sun um, all day long digging and finding nothing. But but for me, it, it was kind of the evolution. I've always been a researcher at heart. And I very much like to kind of survey the landscape and see what we've missed. And, and in my world, there's there's going to be a thousand antique tractor shows across the United States this year, people swapping stories, talking about machines. You can buy plenty of books on the subject, trying to figure out what we're missing, what the, what the lessons are. And for me, some of this, I spent five years doing competitive intelligence and market research. And, and I look at history in exactly the same way in, in CI work, we do scenario analysis and you, you have these tools and processes to figure out what might happen. It doesn't hurt to do that for something that happened 100 years ago to say, okay, well, what was the landscape? What were the things they could have done? What did they do? And is there something that we can learn from that? And, you know, the difference between libraries and archives is, is archives are primary sources. So they can be easily misinterpreted, especially if you can't kind of put the full picture together. So I do like that needle in, in the haystack. I like the long search. It's it's a very anti-Google view of the world, uh, which is I can't just type in and say, why was John Deere against the tractor business? Um, specifically our, our CEO at the time, William Butterworth, the question that nagged me 
took me five years to find the answer in almost 300 pages. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there that there's forces acting on people and what drives you. And, and I try to correlate that to my own life, which is, well, sometimes I'm just having a terrible day because I didn't sleep well, or I only had one cup of coffee. Well, if you're William Butterworth in 1918, making decisions about the future of the tractor business and John Deere, uh, I don't want to oversimplify, but he may have just had presser, pressures acting on him. And he's just like, forget this. <laughs> yeah. I got bigger fish to fry. Yeah. And, and the, what's interesting about your role is a lot of the knowledge compounds too, because there's context and you read something that a lot of people would probably skip over. But as you accumulate knowledge on the topic, you get to kind of triangulate what's, what's going on. Um, would love to hear, uh, you can one, two, three stories about either things you came across or um, tractors, letters, whatever, uh, exciting, depressing, good, bad in between that were either just interesting to you, um, surprises, things that change your perspective on kind of uh, the company or the history of, of what you've been working on. Yeah, there's a couple that, that pop into my mind. One, you know, one of the most popular tractors of all time was the Farmall from International Harvester. And they had a small group of engineers who were who were building a new machine form. And they, they finally figured it out. Uh, there's this great scene in the book in December of 1920, where these engineers get together in a room um, at Harvester's headquarters in, in Chicago. They put the motion picture um, on the reel, you know, probably this like 16 millimeter slot, uh, projector, and they show a film testing an early experimental farm all. And the, the future CEO, Alexander Legg, looks at it and says, this is great. We don't have any money. <laughs> we, 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 we can't do it because we just invested everything into what becomes the McCormick Deering 1530 and 1020, these two machines. And we recognize it. We probably have enough money to build four or five, uh, which they approve. And then they cut that down to a couple. It takes another three years for them to start understanding that there was a really big market for it. And all of a sudden they got a machine to compete with the, the Fordson and Henry Ford. And it's one of the things that drives Henry Ford out of business, at least in the tractor industry a couple of years later. One of those great, well, this almost didn't happen. Um, yeah. and, and what are the cascading kind of events that came as a result of that because you're chasing the farm all and that partially resulted in the general purpose tractor from John Deere. Um, so these things are all related. Uh, another story going back to William Butterworth is there's a letter that he wrote in, in 1916, where he says, I'm not going to make the next board meeting, but whatever happens, I want you to put a stop to any discussion about our future uh, manufacturing tractors. And, and so the interpretation of this is John Deere CEO is opposed to the tractor. Uh, that's it. Well, it, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me because Deere's a couple hundred thousand dollars into R&D in the tractor business. They built one in 1912. They're, they they had a couple other models in 1913 and 14. They're three years into the development of what becomes the all-wheel drive tractor. So why is the CEO opposed but green lighting money? It just didn't make sense. Well, I had to go back to 1912 when the board passed a resolution that said, we're going to we're going to investigate this business. And then they said there's four ways that we could go about it. One of them is build a factory and manufacture tractors. There's other alternatives. We can buy someone. We can outsource all, all the, 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 the design. Uh, we can do all of these things. And so then you go back to William Butterworth and look at the letter. And he specifically says, I'm opposed to the manufacture of tractors. Okay, that makes sense to me. Well, what's driving that? Well, what's driving it is a month before Henry Ford shows his tractor at a farm show in Fremont, Nebraska for the first time. And Deere looks at it and says, yeah, we don't stand a chance. <laughs> wow. We can't afford it. We can't scale. So we've got to we've got to think about our strategy. And he's saying, all right, well, we got three options on the table. Um, so, again, you kind of look at the long game and you have to pay attention to what people say and what they write um, versus kind of extracting it. And I know often when I see that letter reused in a presentation or in an article, 
they truncate the letter in the sentence and they cut out the important parts of that sentence, which says the manufacturer of tractors. That's a, that's a very 2020 thing, 2022 thing to do, right? Just the headline, chop off the rest of the context and just give you the, the clickbait because with the rest of it, it, it tells a different story. Um, how does most of the, so we got a, a bunch of people listening to the show from all over the world, every single corner, every country, just about. Um, how does most of the new or different uh, information come across your desk at this point? Is it like Google alerts? Are you getting letters from, you know, South America from somebody who sends something in? Like how, how does, how, what is the day-to-day -day process going forward at this point? Uh, is it mostly inbound? Um, what, what's it look like? It's, it's mostly us, us going out hmm. and, and, and finding something. So it used to be that we just had a pipeline of records because someone would retire or get a new job and they'd say, I don't want to deal with this stuff. I'm going to send it to the archives. So it, it was pretty easy other than the volume. Um, then all of a sudden you have the advent of the digital age where you're dealing, there, there's just more volume, first of all. There's a lot more drafts of everything. And you got to be a little more selective and say, okay, well, we want something from this source or because it's this product line or because it's just so obvious that we need to kind of document the history of this. And, and now you're getting into things like um, archiving websites, archiving social media. We're going out and scraping. Yeah, we're setting up those alerts. Um, and and it's, it's really a challenge because you don't know that you got it right. You don't know what's important necessarily. So I went out a number of years ago and interviewed a lot of former employees. John Deere formed its precision farming group in 1993. This is when Deere said we're getting into the precision agriculture business wholeheartedly and created a separate division. It feels like it was 100 years ago. But I, I, I recognize that those employees were still with the company. So I went out and did interviews. And, and it's everything from, you know, who said yes? What were your other ideas? What did you pass on? Who was in the room? Because you want those details. Um, and then it was other things like, okay, tell me everything that you got wrong. Tell me what went badly. And, and for me as an archivist, it's not about kind of that secondary version of, well, we had a brilliant idea. Everything was great. My job is to extract the stories so that in 40 years, someone can put those pieces together. And um, I think the hardest part for me is knowing that we miss more now than ever. Uh, but but also there's just the, the way I often say it to people is we collect a lot less. There's just a lot more of it. Mm. Um, so how do you kind of get through the volume and actually get at the essence of what you're trying to accomplish? Well, listeners, if you email Neil or send him a letter, CC me. I want to I want to hear your uh, crazy John Deere story from whatever country corner of the world you're in. Uh, I love uh, the history slash um, Sherlock Holmes um, is there anything that's like your white whale? You're like, you know what? I've been looking for this for five years now and can't find it. Or there's an area that you're like, you know, I, there's this missing piece. Is there anything that's on the search that you are um, have yet to uncover? Well, top on my list is anything connected to John Deere, the person, because he didn't leave us a whole lot. We've, we, we actually have a two-piece wool bathing suit owned by John Deere, believe it or not. <laughs> we, we've got a few letters. We've, we've had things offered to us that we can't prove that it's kind of the real deal or had any connection. Um, kind of really number one on my list is, is kind of a, a local legend that there's a, an underground tunnel that goes through Moline where there's some abandoned vehicles. And it's part of a, a former limestone quarry that was owned by members of the deer family 130 years ago mm. and there's there's been some stories of people seeing abandoned tractors and automobiles the quad cities was an automobile hub in the early 20th century and uh i just i want to find it and i want to get into the tunnel it terrifies me but it it really caters to the indiana jones side of my personality so I've been poking around here and there. I've heard some stories, none of them match. So it has nothing to do with archives. It just has to do with me trying to, I just want to find something really cool. I love it. So um, as we look out to the horizon, 22, 2022 and beyond, 
what's on your brain? What are you scratching your head about? What are you thinking about? Is you thinking about putting pen to paper again? You taking a little sabbatical from the writing? What's uh what's in store for Neil? What's in store is getting out into the world again. It's it's really hard to release a book when you can't go have book signings and and can't go out and talk to people because part of this for me is it's it's the listening side of things. Like I can tell the story, here's what I put together, you put your work out there. Now, like how are you going to fill in the gaps? And, and so I'm just excited to get out and talk to people to to understand what what they know. Strangely enough, what did I miss? Because I probably didn't get it all right. I did from my perspective, but what are the other perspectives? Um, but I'll spend the summer chasing my 12 year old around the ball fields probably. So that'll, that'll be the main thing. And then, and then getting out and talking about the book around that. What's the best way to uh, kind of get in touch with you? Is there a way, Neil? Um, are you, uh, do you have any sort of public facing website or anything? How do people uh, get in touch with you? They want to send you their secret John Deere correspondence from a long time ago. Find me at neildahlstrom.com. I'm on, on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. So I'm all over the place. And uh, share, yeah, share your stories. If 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 you've got that uh, that first plow that John Deere built in 1837, let me know. I'd like to have it. <laughs> Neil, it's been a blast. You guys check out his new book, Tractor Wars, on Amazon and anywhere good books are found. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.